uh, we have a, a Q&A session now. Um, so I'll hand over to Jazz Dalliwell first, just for a very brief introduction. Thank you, John. Um, evening to you all. Hope you're surviving the, the heat um, better than I've been today. Um, in terms of myself, um, I'm a barrister at Citadel Chambers in Birmingham. Um, my primary practice is in respect of criminal law. Uh, I've been at Citadel since January 2020. I began my pupillage back in, in I think, November 2018 um, at KBG Chambers in Plymouth. Um, and yep, so I spend the majority of my time doing criminal work day in, day out. I'm in court, um, doing advocacy and and um, uh, and doing the doing the the job that is uh, quite a fun job at times of being a criminal barrister. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I'll hand over now to Beth for a brief introduction. Um, yes, so I'm currently a pupil barrister at Nine St John Street Chambers in Manchester. I started my pupilage last September, so I'm about halfway through second six. So I've been on my feet now for about three or four months. Uh, before I started pupillage, I did the bar course at BPP in Manchester, finished that last summer. Uh, my pupillage is a specialist PI pupillage, but I also do a little bit of crime. So I spend a lot of time uh, currently in the magistrate's court prosecuting, uh, which is, as Jazz said, sometimes great fun. Thank you, Beth. And lastly, I'll hand over to Robert for a brief introduction. Um, so my name is Robert. I am a future pupil barrister at Park Lane Plowden. Um, I'm going to be starting with them in October, October the 3rd, and then going through obviously till next year, starting my second six and looking forward to that in April. Um, my pupillage is a civil pupillage, so employment, clinical negligence, personal injury. Um, and I'm thoroughly looking forward to getting started with it. At the moment, I'm doing some devilling for a member of Chambers. So I'm getting some experience and, and getting used to what it will be like in practice. But uh, no, can't wait for October. Thank you very much. So those are your panellists for this evening. So I'm going to start off by uh, running through some of the pre-prepared questions that uh, you will have submitted in advance. Um, so we'll do that for about 15 or 20 minutes. And um, if you can think of any questions that you want to put to our panellists, you can either pop them in the chat box and we'll get to those questions uh, later on in the evening. Or if you're feeling brave later on, you can pop your hand up and ask the question uh, personally. So we'll start uh, with a nice open question that was uh, posed um, from somebody that signed up. Um, and I'll put this to, to all three of our panellists. Uh, so what is the best skill to have as a good advocate? Um, so we'll, we'll jump in the, the same order that we've um, ran through so far. So Jazz, would you like to start on this one? The best sure. skill to have as a good advocate. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer because I think, and I, I hope I'm not sitting too much on the fence here, but I don't think there is one particular skill that, um, that, that a barrister needs to have. I think, I think that the beauty of advocacy is everyone has their own different style. People have different strengths and weaknesses. Some people uh, can achieve just a good result in a devastating cross-examination as they can um, negotiating beforehand and, and, and still get an, an ideal and good result for their clients. So everyone has their own individual style. Everyone has their own individual strengths and weaknesses. And I think advocacy is more about highlighting your particular strengths and your particular skills. But I think if I, if I tried to narrow it down um, to what I think I try to focus on as much as I can, I, I think it is very difficult to get past um, just the ability and, and need to work very hard um, for an extended period of time. Um, I think that slightly transcends everything, really. If you put hard work into your preparation, into the way you um, conduct your advocacy in court, the way you deal with, with your clients and, and put effort into building relationships with solicitors and, and generally just putting the effort in, um, I think that is something which I've seen um, a, a, to be a very consistent feature in, in some of the advocates I look up to and, and I really admire just the ability to work very hard for long periods of time for for many years not just for the short term um i think secondly and it's one that i stole from from an advocate on a q a session a few years ago actually um i, I think the ability to work with people and, and get on with people and be uh, just generally be quite nice and be a nice person i think that's quite an important skill i think quite an underrated skill um it, my job at least and especially in criminal law we're dealing with people every day. 
every day I'm talking to a different person, it's a different judge or it's a different client or it's a different solicitor or um, you know, different court clerk, different usher. And I think if you can get on with people, it makes your day easier, it makes their day easier, it helps you get to, I think, the, the outcome you're looking for easier. And also, it, it, perhaps it goes into the, the hard work element of it. It helps you enjoy your job. If you're having nice, pleasant interactions with people um, and getting hopefully positive results out of it, um, it helps you to enjoy the job, helps you keep going for the long term and maintain that passion, I think. So those are two things which I think are quite important in the work we do. Great advice there, Jazz. And I completely echo what you say there. So thank you. Uh, Beth, any, any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, I think that hard work and preparation is always going to be the sort of stock answer. And I think that's going to come up in response to quite a few of the, the certainly prepared questions that we've we've received. I think another skill which sometimes is overlooked, I think, when we think about advocacy is the ability to listen. That's listen to your opponent to what they're saying. The number of times I've been in court in second six and I've, for example, conceded an issue and yet my opponent has still pursued it as an issue in the closing speech. And the judge just said, did you not listen to what your learned friend has just said? She's conceded that you don't need to raise that point. So I think being able to listen is going to help you to narrow down the issues and only deal with the things that really need to be dealt with. The other key thing is to really listen to the judge when the judge is asking you a question, because sometimes when you do your preparation, you might identify a sort of problematic area for you in your case. And you think, oh, gosh, he's definitely going to ask me about that. And sometimes when the judge does ask you a question, you can think they're asking you about that. And actually they're asking you about something completely different. So listen really closely to the question, ask for clarification if you need it and answer it in the knowledge that you've fully understood that question and what the judge wants from you. And sometimes the judge is giving you a bit of a direction. He's trying to, he or she is trying to lead you down a path because that's what they want you to deal with. Um, so take, take your next steps from where the judge is leading you. Great advice there, Beth. Uh, and lastly, Robert, any final uh, points on what makes a good advocate? Well, I think there's a, a all very um, very apt, but to come up with something slightly different for, for the sake of um, variety, I would say versatility in a word. Um, I think if you want to see the importance of versatility, you only need to go as far as watching some of the Court of Appeal hearings, which are available online. Um, when you watch those hearings, you see sometimes the judge will be, be prepared to be guided by your submissions. And of course, in a moot, that's usually what happens. They're interested in what you've got to say and how you want to structure it and set it out. Um, but other times, and particularly when you see the, the Court of Appeal, the judges will have read the papers, they'll come to the hearing with a, a specific predetermined view of, of the issues, uh, what those issues are and, and how they want to get about resolving them. Um, and they'll have specific questions or concerns that they want to raise in line with that view. Um, and another thing I think on versatility, which is, you, you see this a lot in mooting, I certainly have, um, counsel being asked a question and saying, well, I'm going to come to that. So if you could just bear with me, give me five minutes. And that's part of my, you know, my second submission or my third submission. Um, and I thought tonight watching the moot, Matthew did that very well because he was asked a question and put in that position. And he said, well, that is part of my second submission, but as it's been raised now, we'll move straight on to it. Um, if you don't answer the question that the, the judge has at that moment, all they're going to be thinking about until you do answer it is that question. So you're basically wasting air and time and energy by not moving on to that point. So versatility, being prepared to obviously have, have the, the course that you want to set out in your submissions, but being prepared to realise that the court isn't with you on that uh, and wants to perhaps hear them in a different way, hear them in a different order, um, that is fundamental to being a prepared advocate and turning up for court. Great advice from all of our panellists there. Uh, now, of course, turning to mooting, um, the next question relates to, to, uh, to moots. Um, the question is, is there a danger of being too formal or formulaic when mooting? Um, so the example given, it says, for example, ending each point by informing the judge when you're finished with that point and that you'll move on to your next point. So, um, uh, 
we can expand this a little bit beyond that to sort of any sort of general tips for mooting. But um, if we can start with the uh, with the point itself, you know, about sort of the, the, the how formulaic you need to be when it comes to mooting. So do we have anyone that wants to jump in uh, with a suggestion on this? I don't mind um, just giving a couple of thoughts. Um, I think it's difficult to be too, well, I mean, obviously you don't want to be too formulaic and, and come across robotic, I think is, is, is maybe the point. But I don't think there's anything wrong with signposting or obviously informing the court of uh, that you're moving on to the next point. I think that's the, the right and proper way to do it. And those kind of formalities, at least in a moot, you might not necessarily do them in, in court. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily do that if I was doing, say, an application to exclude a certain piece of evidence um, at every step of the way probably be a bit more natural but when it comes to a moot of course there is a certain marking criteria um, and of course being able to comply with the formalities and understand the formalities of the court um, I think is always a good thing I think it shows um, that you're really paying attention to the details the little details that you're not just thinking about the big picture submissions but you're also going slightly further and picking up on how you can make it as easy as as possible for the judge to follow you and also as accessible uh, for the judge to hear your submissions. Um, I think I think I take the, the phrasing of that question formulaic to mean, um, of course, you don't want your advocacy to become, as I said, robotic. You don't want it to become, um, you don't want the formality to get in the way of what you're actually trying to say. So if you're wasting lots and lots of time dealing with citations and page references, um, try and cut back as much as you can, as much as you reasonably can, and focus on the actual submissions. But it's a balancing act, of course, because at the end of the day, as much as advocacy is subjective, I think judging is as well. Uh, and some judges will um, tend to uh, gravitate more towards formality than others. Uh, and that's, that's just a natural part of it. Um, everyone has their own individual preferences. Um, and I think you've just got to be aware of, uh, of, of how much you can comply with the formalities to show that you've got that mooting ability. Um, whilst at the same time being able to actually get to your point um, and actually make your make your submission. Thanks, Jazz. And I think that's, that's it. Sorry, John. I, I think that's it. it. It depends on the tribunal. You know, some tribunals will want you to be more formal than others. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes you just want to get straight to the point. But I think with mooting, you do have to accept that there is a degree of formality that's perhaps expected over and above general advocacy in practice. Um, and that is part of it, as, as Jazz says, that's the, the marking criteria. Um, you've got to tick those boxes to, to get the points, as it were. Um, but I think it's also worth noting that you will make mistakes with that formal uh, approach along the way, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, I would say. I mean, you can, you can develop and, and practice those formal techniques, and they don't really come naturally to any of us. I mean, no one starts most of the things they say with, may it please whoever you're talking to, um, but once you get to grips with that and you start getting comfortable with the language and getting comfortable with the structures, then you can start to rein it back. So I think don't be afraid to make mistakes early. I certainly did. And I've been told many times, you know, that was too formal or that lacked formality. And, and, and you will you have to experiment and find your own way. But I think it's part of the process of, of developing those mooting skills is to make those mistakes. And if anything, it's probably best to be slightly overly formal. But as soon as, for example, the, the court says, well, you don't need to bother with citations, take that on board. Don't keep hammering the same point. Once you get the, the idea that they're not with you on something um, in, your, in your style, change it very quickly. And again, that goes back to the versatility thing. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Beth, any final thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree with what's been said already. I think with formality, there's always a danger of swinging too far either way, either being far too formal or not formal enough to the point where the tribunal actually find you coming across as rude as an advocate, which it would always be preferable to be too formal than to go too far the other way. I think in, in terms of the signposting in particular, it really depends on how complex your points are and how complex your structure is. If you're only making three main submissions, it's probably not necessary to be as formulaic as if you've got four submissions within three grounds, for example. Signposting is all about helping the judge to follow where you are. And I think it's very context-based. I don't think there can be a hard and fast rule on that. Yeah, completely agree. Um, I'd agree with all of the advice there. 
And I think the thing to remember is that with mooting or any form of advocacy, it's about trying to be persuasive. So, you know, if, if you're worried when it comes to being formulaic about point one is, point two is, I think you're going to bore the judge quite quickly. What you really want to do uh, is, you know, use the skeleton argument to your advantage. So if there's a particular point in the skeleton argument that's going to support your argument, then bring the judge back to it, refer the judge back to, to the uh, skeleton argument at that stage. But don't don't worry too much about saying, I'm now moving on to point three. Let me begin this. So, um, you know, you, you need to it needs to be almost conversational, but maintaining the formality that's required for, for mooting. I was just about to say that, John, I totally agree. You're there to have a conversation with the judge, not to give a speech. Yeah. And I think once you get to grips with that, and that, you know, that certainly took me some time because you prepare your submissions and you just want to deliver them. And if anything, when, it, when the court asks you a question, you think, especially in the time pressure of meeting, you think, oh, for goodness sake, I just want to get to the end of my speech and you're wasting my time in, in asking these questions. It's completely the wrong way of looking at it. When they ask you a question, it's because they want to know the answer. And, and it's a helpful way of... of developing your arguments from that point of view, but you're there to have a conversation, not to give a speech. Yeah, completely agree, great advice there. And um, the next question relates to trial advocacy. So this might be one for Jazz and possibly, uh, possibly Beth might have some answers on this as well. Um, any tips for effective cross-examination? Um, I'll start, start with Jazz as the most experienced panelist. Well, not, not not massively experienced, but um, <laughs> um, still still learning. So every day is a school day. Um, I think that the the first thing when I when I think about cross examining any witness, the first thing I, I think about is what do I want to get out of this witness? What is my objective here? Um, what is my case theory? And I think I, I always think quite carefully about what is my client's case and what is my case theory. Um, or if I'm prosecution, of course, what is a prosecution case and what is our case theory? Um, and how exactly does this witness fit into or not fit into that case theory? Um, and I think quite quickly, I narrow down the key topics and the key areas um, that I need to address with the witness that support um, my case theory and go against the other side's case theory. Um, after that, after I initially kind of brainstorm those, those few points, you have to think quite carefully before you get down to um, really putting the questions together is, is, again, like Robert said previously, your audience and your tribunal effectively. Witnesses come in all different shapes and sizes, different ages. So you can have youths as witnesses, children, vulnerable people with, with dis difficulties and disabilities, elderly people. Um, people uh, just middle-aged or, or young adults you get the whole different range of spectrum um, and, and so before you get on with really getting into your questions you have to know how is this person going to respond to those questions and are my questions appropriate for that witness um, and am I am I going about it the right way and then I think I get down to 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 thinking about the questions but I, I generally try to keep it a bit more loose now and I think I think it's something that you, you, you get better at as you get more experience. When I first started, it was all quite formulaic. Um, the questions were uh, already in my head. I had a good grasp of exactly the, the phrasing of the question I was going to use. But I think as you get more experience, you just focus more on the topics effectively, like I talked about previously, uh, and, and exactly um, what the end result of that topic should be. So at the end of me addressing this topic with this witness, I hope to get this answer out of it that I can later rely on if I um, cross am a different witness or in my closing speech. Um, so, so I think you want to try to keep it as flexible as possible in that regard. And again, that slightly goes back to, I think, what Beth said at the start, when you should be listening to the witness. And that was also something which I've worked a great deal on over the last few years is actually listening to what the witness is saying, as opposed to presuming you're going to get that answer because you've assumed it will go the way it goes. Sometimes you ask one question, you get exactly the answer you need and you can just move straight on to the next topic. You don't have to bother with the other 10, 15 questions that you had prepared. So always be listening to the witness um, and staying alive to exactly what's being said. And then you can adapt your cross-examination as you go. I think that's important is, is think of it as an adaptive process. It's a, it's a living, breathing thing effectively if you want to think of it that way. It's not a rigid structure and formula that you must have prepared uh, well in advance of, of the cross-examination. Try to keep it as flexible and 
and as workable as you can. Great advice there, Jazz. That was a, quite a comprehensive answer there. So you've covered quite a lot. I don't know whether our panelists have other panelists have anything to add to that. I did have one one other point, um, which is that I think the tendency with cross examination is to think, right, I need to challenge this witness. I'm challenging their account because I don't believe them, and what they say doesn't help me. But actually, some confrontational or, or challenge a witness sometimes the witness that you're cross-examining can help you. They can give you an answer that you want. And Jazz touched on this uh, in his response. I, last week, I sat in on a, a murder trial. and There were two defendants. And it was really interesting to watch how the barristers moved between, at times, being challenging towards a witness. So saying, no, that's not right. This is actually happened. But at other times saying, yeah, that did happen, didn't it? My, my guy wasn't the one with the hammer, for example. Uh, and it's, again, thinking about what you want to get out of the witness, whether being cross with them in cross-examination is the way to do that, or actually, can they just help you? Because in that, on that issue, you've got the same goal as the witness. Mm, definitely. Great advice there. I think I think one of the points to make it is you know think about where you're going with that witness, build up in stages, nice short questions, and um, building up to your points are normally the best way. There's often a temptation to try and uh, throw everything in at once and raise about five points in one question with the witness, uh, when it doesn't really help anyone. You know, it's, so keep the question short and simple, one point at a time, one point per question, um, and know when to stop. You know, the, the, it can often happen where you ask one question too many. You get the wrong answer and it blows your whole case to smithereens. So once you've got what you need, stop, get out. Right. Um, next question. Um, probably once again will be for the same uh, same two panellists again. So Beth and Jazz. Um, any tips for starting out in a, as a criminal pupil? So obviously, Beth, you've covered a little bit of crime and Jazz, you've uh, covered crime within your pupillage. So any tips for starting out as a criminal pupil? Yeah, I, I started as a PI pupil and it was only as I got further in that I had a discussion with my pupil supervisor and he thought it would be useful for me to, to do some crime, uh, primarily actually because my bar course was fully remote and so crime was a really good way to see in-person advocacy. Um, I think one thing you can do before you start is just go back to the basics, go back to your criminal procedure, make sure you've got those basics under your belt so that if you have to make a bad character application, you don't have to spend 30 minutes reviewing your notes. You've just got those, got those uh, in your mind. As a first six pupil, what I started to do when I was shadowing was prepare a case as if I was actually doing the case as the barrister instructed. It's, it's good to go and sit in and watch, but it's even better if you thought in advance about how you would do it, because then you can compare how you prepared it to how somebody else has done it. And it will never be the same because we all have different ways of doing advocacy, but you can see the successes of how that barrister has done it and perhaps think, oh, actually, I think the way I prepared it might have had a better result in this case. So rather than being a mere observer, I would say try and participate in it as much as you can. Excellent. Great answer there. Uh, Jazz, anything to add? Um, I agree with everything that Beth has said there. Absolutely spot on. Um, I think the main thing I would say is just watch everything you possibly can. Observe, pay attention to every single detail as much as you can. It's not always easy, I think, when you're a pupil there's a tendency to feel, and I certainly felt just quite self-conscious, you know, you, you, you want to make sure that you're, you're not saying anything you shouldn't be saying or, or, or coming across a way that you don't want to come across and, and you spend a lot of time worrying about how, how you're being perceived. But just try to pay attention to um, your supervisor as much as possible, the other advocates, how they interact with each other, um, how, they, they, how they negotiate, how they deal with, with court staff, all those sorts of little details, um, I, I think are aside from just the, the nitty-gritty of the law I think those are really important aspects of of learning how to be how to be a successful pupil um, hopefully and I think um, just flowing on from that would probably be um, asking questions um, ask questions it's not always easy because advocates are busy and running around courts and um, and there's lots to get done but if you can find a quiet moment just to ask a, a burning question or, or or anything like that it shows that you've really paid attention to to what's happening um, during the day. Um, I, I think the final thing I would say, and, and 
what helped me a lot during during my pupillage is to develop and try to develop a, a, a network or, or a network of people that you trust and that you can turn to at a moment's notice. And um, if you if you uh, if you have a difficult case the next day, you need to run through ideas with someone, um, or just generally discuss how things are at the bar. Uh, whether that's someone close to your level of call, a few years senior or very senior, um, it helps to have a few people, just a few contacts that you can ring up and and who can uh, who can guide you through those early few months. Good tips there. Thank you, Jazz. Right, I think I'll turn to one more question before we uh, open this up to the audience. Uh, this is open to anyone, and this can apply to either mooting or sort of court advocacy. Um, which aspect of advocacy do you find most difficult, and how have you looked to overcome that difficulty? Uh, I think it's, just as I was alluding to earlier, it's about getting to grips with the purpose of why you're there. Um, you, you're there to persuade the judge. How do you do that? You have a conversation with them. You're not there to give a speech. Uh, you know, that's just not going to work. It's, it's, it's not going to be interactive. It's not going to be um, the best way of actually getting through the issues. It just doesn't work like that. Um, so I think always coming back to that motto of how can I help the judge? Remember, it's that conversation, and it's a it's a form it's, it's a it's a formal conversation, which seems like a bit of a dichotomy at first. But once you get to grips with those um, basic structures and basic modes of language, which we were talking about earlier, then it becomes a lot more natural to do that. But I think that's what you've got to keep returning to: is thinking about how can you assist the court. And of course, a large part of that is in preparation as well. If you know where your page numbers are, you know what your cases are, you know your points then the conversation again becomes a lot easier. So I think doing all of that preparation makes it so much easier to be natural when you're then appearing in front of the tribunal because you've got all of that work and that confidence behind you. You can then start to relax into it and you can actually see it for what it is, which it should be a two-way dialogue. Uh, and if it's not a two-way dialogue, the judge isn't engaging with what you're saying, then either it's going very, very well or very, very badly. Um, but probably most of the time, the latter rather than the former. Thanks, Robert. Uh, does anyone else have any advice on this point? I think um, I, I think Robert covered a great deal of it there. Um, I think that I think it's a very good point. When you're first on your feet and you're first doing your first bits of advocacy, um, it's very easy to feel very awkward, and it's very easy to, I think, as Robert said, just have everything. Effectively, you just want to give your speech and get out of there, um, rather than have the conversation. Um, I think that's something that just comes with experience, really. If you just keep doing it, and that includes mooting, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be the job, you know, mooting, debating, um, these types of events and activities um, help you develop that more natural flow, that more natural style, which fits into your way of doing it. Um, and then it becomes more of a conversation. You, you're less reliant on, on even just things like notes, effectively. And, and you can just, you, you have your case in your head and you can just focus on, on having that engagement with the judge or with whoever, whoever the tribunal is, whether it's a jury or, or whoever it might be. Thank you. Uh, Beth, any final thoughts on that point? I think it's mostly being covered, maybe to, to deal with it from a slightly different angle. I think when you start out as a second six pupil in particular, you, are, you need to expect to face some challenges and also some criticism. And it's something that we see a little bit in moots, um, but it's quite a supportive environment when you're mooting. When you're in court for real and you have real judges who have a lot of cases to get through, some of them can be a little bit impatient with you and some of them can be really quite critical. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that that's normal when you start out, at least that's what I've been told, um, and that you just have to do your best and crack on and not crumble under that pressure keep your head, keep going, and you'll learn for the next time. But that idea that criticism is bad, I think is something that comes through academics. And I think putting that to one side and just thinking, no, I just need to get through this, I keep my head, make the points I need to make, even if I've not got the best case, for example. Um, I think that's a really important thing to recognise as a pupil. Yeah, so Rebecca and Michael, do you have any anything to add on this point? 
Yes, I mean, I think the original question was about whether uh, what we found difficult and how we overcame it. Mm. And from my point of view, it was knowing um, how far is too far, which is something I tend to struggle with in real life. Um, I like the courtroom because it has rules and it has structure to it that a normal social interaction doesn't. Um, but sometimes I would be concerned, or well, what is this point going to sound a bit stupid? Or is the judge going to think I'm an idiot? Um, am I going to get told off for raising it? And the reality is, if it is uh, well-founded, arguable, properly arguable is what you need to always come back to, because that's the ethical principle, and you can support it in law and in fact, then you are welcome to put the point, even if the judge is going to disagree with you. Uh, so just think about the best way of putting it. And that's what I found the easiest way of dealing with that nervousness, which comes from being new and comes from not necessarily knowing the tribunal that's in front of you. Um, but any uh, good judge will appreciate any well put point, even if they ultimately disagree with you. And um, one of the questions that came up before, and I, I'll uh, turn this question to uh, Michael and Rebecca, who haven't had a chance to answer this. Um, what would you say the best skill is to have as a good advocate? Or, or what, what skills can we look for in a good advocate? It's not one single skill. What skills would a good advocate have? Um, I think two things that are generally helpful. Um, obviously, you, there are specific skills, but trying to think of it in terms of the generality. I think one is robustness because you need to be able to deal with the difficult judge and even things like the difficult witness because it can be quite trying at times to cross-examine a witness who's a bit rude because of course the judge is the same as us in the sense that they're bound by you know, professional conduct rules and therefore even if they find me incredibly annoying they will generally keep that under their hat. Whereas witnesses who I'm putting under pressure don't have that same obligation. And you can sometimes find that they become quite uh, rude, quite aggressive, and you have to remain robust enough to keep pressing points um, in the face of sometimes a degree of, of criticism. And to be able to sort of take control of the situation um, as the lawyer rather than as the, the witness. So I think robustness is very important. Um, because it really underpins your ability to put your case. If you crumble too early in the face of a, an angry judge or just a rude witness and you just think, you know what, I think I'll just stop there, um, then it doesn't really matter how good you are at everything else because you won't have got there in the course of your cross-examination or the course of your closing speech. The second overarching skill that I think is important is having a, a degree of calm and um, that doesn't mean that you don't panic, but it does mean that you try and mask your panic as best as you possibly can. Um, so that when you are in court, you conduct yourself as best as you possibly can uh, with all of the all of the fuss of a Rolls Royce coasting slowly down a hill. Uh, if you start to look as though you're losing control of the case, then you will inevitably lose your judge who will find you less persuasive. Uh, you might lose your client who just think, who is this person and what are they playing at? So when things start to go off what you might have expected, so for example, you are cross-examining a witness and they say something that you simply were not anticipating, the ability to calmly and coolly deal with that and keep a clear head, I think is very important because then again, it allows all of your other skills to come to the fore. Whereas if you panic, then sometimes your polished skills simply don't get the chance to shine because you're too busy panicking and maybe saying something silly or uh, doing something that you shouldn't. So I think those two things are important, robustness and calm, or the projection of calm. Great practical tips there, Michael. Uh, Rebecca, anything to add? Um, yes, they, they somewhat overlap, but uh, I would say the ability to fake it till you make it. We're in a profession where imposter syndrome is rife. Uh, I struggle with it. It affects my drafting more than my advocacy, because if I say something a bit silly, everyone accepts that you're on your feet. Whereas if you send something that you're supposed to have read, reread, proofread, 
done all the research on and you say something a bit silly, it's a lot more embarrassing uh, uh, yeah, and, and potentially other consequences. And I always give the example of the duck. Um, it's often the swan, but I think as new lawyers, we should settle for being a duck uh, and being completely calm on the surface, even if our legs are um, panically moving underneath the water. Uh, and the other is the ability to take time uh, and to pause. It's often very uh, intimidating to ask for a moment, but when you have judicial intervention, it's often better to say, can I just take a moment to consider that question than it is to start rambling and hope you're going to get to the point um, eventually. Uh, judges much rather you take you know, 10 seconds to think about it than come out with some nonsense. Uh, and hand in hand with that, and something I think that was asked earlier that I came in partway through in respect of um, witnesses, is silence. Don't be afraid of the silence, because um, sometimes in cross-examination, silence is golden. You ask a question and they can't answer it. You give them every fair opportunity to answer it. And I tend to do it in stages, ask the question ask if they need the question again, reword the question, and then I will warn them of the inference that I'm going to ask the judge, because I do civil so I don't have the jury, um, uh, warn them of the inference I will be asking the judge ultimately to make from their silence. Uh, but it is hugely impactful. And if you're just hurrying them along or moving on to the next question, then that doesn't hang in the air in quite the same way. Great advice. Right. Uh, the next question uh, that we have is, um, do you notice any common mistakes in closing speeches? So I'll open this one up a little bit. So uh, we won't just look at mistakes. We'll look at any general tips for closing speeches as well. Um, so I, I will open this to, to all five of our panellists. So are there any mistakes that you see in closing speeches or any tips for closing speeches? Um, I think there are a couple of things that spring to my mind. Um, one is a lack of structure. So you'll sometimes, and I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anyone that I've seen, you'll sometimes hear a closing speech or give a closing speech, which is something of a blunderbuss of points. And you are saying everything right, but you almost want to get the transcript and chop it up into sections and put it into a much better structure. Because if you do that, then your points will be that much more impactful. But I think particularly in civil work, um, it, it tends to be the case that as soon as you finish the evidence, you go straight into giving your closing speech. And so you don't necessarily have time to reflect on what you'd like to say. So you have to have a, something of a structure beforehand that you've identified as being the right way of doing it. Um, and then you have to supplement that with obviously the evidence as it has in fact come out. But what I sometimes see is, is people that just sort of pick points seemingly at random um, and make all the points, but don't necessarily put them all in the right order. Um, and then the other thing that I think isn't necessary, well, the other thing that I see in closing speeches a lot is um, either pushing the wrong point or not dealing with adverse points at all. So sometimes you will have instructions and you'll have to put a point that's bad, but you should know if you're putting a point that's not your strongest point. And I have seen a lot of advocates really push things where the law is just against them or the, the evidence is against them. And that tends to alienate the judge. I mean, that when you do get onto your good point and the judge is already rather lost on what it is that you're saying, and you've lost a bit of credibility there. Um, conversely, of course, you can't just ignore a bad point. You have to try and deal with them as best as you can uh, and not just leave them so that the only party to have referred to them is the other side, because that would be much more damaging. So that's a, a few tips. Thanks, Michael. Some good tips there. Uh, do we have any thoughts from any other panelists? Very quickly, a, a point which comes to mind for me is that the best closed speech I've ever seen, the best closed speech, jury, jury speech I've ever seen, was quite a few years ago now. And I remember it was a multi-handed drugs case. I think it was about two weeks long. And out of all of the, I think, six or seven defendants, th that closing speech was the shortest. I think it was only 20, 25 minutes long, if that. 
um, all of the other speeches were at least double, maybe three times uh, longer than that. And um, the, the barrister who made that closing speech, his um, client was the only one acquitted. That doesn't necessarily mean that was the world's greatest closing speech, and that was the only reason why his client was acquitted. Um, but the, the length of your closing speech doesn't necessarily correlate with the quality of the closing speech. Um, concision, um, directness, um, and also not patronising the jury, I think are always, always good things that, to bear in mind when it comes to closing speeches. Excellent. Good, good practical tip there, Jazz. Um, okay, I think what we'll sorry, do... Sorry, John, I've just got one more very boring... Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I've never done a closing speech. I've only seen them. Um, so my point is purely a practical one, but I do think it's important to remember, as you go through the trial, you're hearing the evidence, and, and as has been said, you know, as Michael alluded to, often in a civil trial, you're just going straight into the closing speech. So you've got to take a good note of all of that evidence so that you can then refer to it and have an organized system so that you can know which evidence from which witnesses you want to point to, and that's easily at your fingertips. In, in assisting with a closing speech preparation, that's what I've seen. The, the clearer your note is, the easier it then becomes, especially in the moment when you haven't got the, the benefit of time to get a good closing speech structure together because you've got it all at your fingertips. 